All right, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you to all of you for coming here when it's a lovely, lovely day outside and yet we're still in here talking about ticks, which is a strange thing to be talking about. But I wanted to just briefly say that my group does a lot of ecological engineering work, but more broadly, we do biotechnology. So we also develop the molecular tools, harness evolution in the lab. And due to some of the implications of the ability to engineer something, especially that can spread on its own, we also need to think about the implications for security and access and who has power to do this. So we do a lot of that aspect as well. And I love to open with this. How many of you read XKCD? Raise your hand if you read XKCD. All right, this is one of, so XKCD is an amazing web comic that you should read if you, if you don't already. Actually, the author lives in Somerville and it is generally math and science and fun stuff. So this is a useful plot of various different fields. You can perhaps look up here and find your field. Risk of your research being used by a supervillain for world domination on the y-axis against the risk of the thing you're studying breaking free from your facility and threatening the local population on the x-axis. Now, you might wonder things like, why is molasses storage here? Well, that's the reference to the great molasses disaster in Boston a century or so ago. You might, in fact, it can break free and threaten the local population. It's not all the way to the left, molasses storage. But the reason why I this really strikes home to me is, well, a couple of reasons, but the main one is that the mention of gene drive, if genetic engineering is somewhere there, genetic engineering that will spread on its own in the environment is surely further to the right. And the challenge is when you figure out how to do something like this, what do you do? Who do you talk to? Who do you get advice from? Do you tell the world? Do you not tell the world? Is it safe? Is it unsafe? How do you know? And it turns out that our society provides basically no guidance on this question whatsoever. Now, I happen to be a bit of a, of a paranoid mindset. So when I figured out that CRISPR could be used for gene drive, I figured out, well, okay, this is clearly something different from medicine. If you develop a new therapeutic, someone's doctor can recommend it to them. They can say no. They can choose not to be affected by your research. So it's okay if you develop that technology in secret. You develop in the lab, you don't tell anyone what you're doing until you get all the way up to the point where you're applying for regulatory approval and then you can have the comment phase and so forth. That's no big deal. Yeah, you're denying them a voice in your technology, but so what? They can always say no. But if you're developing a technology to change the shared environment, people don't get to opt out anymore. That is, they can make the community level decision, do we want this or not? But if they're in the minority, then it's going to affect them no matter what. They don't get to opt out. So there, if you develop it in secret, you're denying them a voice in decisions intended to affect them that they can't opt out of, which basically means that our entire model of scientific incentives and par paranoia over scooping and all that jazz works directly against what is ethical. And we also might ask some questions about, given the current model of scientific publishing and revelations and so forth, would we really want to set it up the way it is if we were interested in positive discovery benefiting the world? Do you want to keep all your explorers ventures a secret from each other? Is that the most efficient way to go about it? Almost certainly not, but that is the way we do things. So the point about gene drive is basically it says, okay, in a sexually reproducing species, if you can ensure that more than half the offspring normally inherit a gene, then it will spread through the population. And this can actually be very efficient. So how does this work? Well, you ensure that in heterozygotes, that is organisms that inherit one copy from a parent, you'll note in every case here, one of them is circled, has the engineered trait. The other parent is not circled and is wild type. <clears throat> but of the offspring, they're all inheriting the engineered version. So this is not how it normally works. Although of course there are genes that have learned to cheat in exactly this manner. How do we learn to cheat? Well, we really couldn't until CRISPR. And how does CRISPR work? Well, you have two alleles, you drop in CRISPR and a repair template, CRISPR cuts, you insert the repair template, the cell does automatically in response to the damage. But what happens in nature, in systems that do this, is some of them have learned to cut the chromosome that they are normally on if it does not encode them. And so if you have a gene drive system on one chromosome, in this case A, it will cut the wild type chromosome that lacks it, and then the cell will naturally look to the other chromosome to repair the damage, and so it will copy over this gene drive system. It's a great parasitic element that takes 
heterozygotes, organisms that have one copy, and in their reproductive cells, and only in their reproductive cells, turns them into homozygotes for the gene drive system. What's new is that with CRISPR, we can program the scissors to target any gene essentially that we want. And that means that you can encode on a single drive system, CRISPR, which does the driving, and whatever other change you want to make. And then you can cause that change to sweep through a population. So <clears throat> I didn't actually tell my advisor, George Church, at the time until I'd thought about it extensively and concluded that it could not be effectively weaponized, which is a separate conversation we're not going to have. But suffice it to say that if you think of a new technology that could potentially be very powerful, please do think of the military applications and make sure you don't tell the world until you're reasonably confident that there aren't any good ones. But what about this question of, should we be engineering ecosystems, right? We haven't really had the power to just have a single person in a lab, edit an organism in the lab and let it go and change the ecosystem anywhere that species lives. That's just not something we could do before. And we've made a lot of ecological changes in other ways, and it hasn't always gone our way. And I will, in fact, point back to Lyme disease here. Why do we have a Lyme epidemic here in the Northeast? It's because we love forests. We love living in forests. That means we build houses in forests, and we build roads in forests, and that means we have lots of carved up forests. We maximize the forest perimeter, which just happens to favor deer and white-footed mice, and therefore the ticks that live on them. And so you maximize the number of ticks in the environment, and you maximize the number of white-footed mice that are the best reservoir of Lyme disease, and you get mouse to tick to mouse to tick to mouse to tick, tick to human. But because the best reservoir is the thing the ticks are biting all the time, and there's a lot of them, you basically ensure that nearly all the mice are infected and nearly all the ticks are infected, and there's a ton of ticks. And this is why we have a Lyme disease problem. That's because we engineered the ecosystem and we inadvertently got this problem. So what we're doing really here is trying to be humble. This is difficult when you're playing about with radical new technologies. It's especially difficult when you, the incentives are to publish and do radical new things and get in the news. But I have three rules and they're all number one because they're all very important for attempting to be humble in this area. But this is not ecosystem specific. This is really applies to most of biology. If you're engineering any kind of complex system that you don't fully understand, that you know you don't fully understand, then there are going to be unexpected consequences when you mess with it. That's just how it is. So pretty much the best you can do is try to make the smallest possible change that you think will solve the relevant problem. Because there are gonna be side effects, so you want to minimize the perturbation so you can minimize the side effects. Perturbation should be only as large as it needs to be to solve the relevant problem. And then you need to see what are those side effects going to be. So you need to start small in one local area and see how it works, ideally in a reversible way. And then you only scale up if warranted. And the big one is if you don't understand the system, there may be someone who understands more than you do. And therefore you should find those people and ask what they think before you go ahead. So the challenge was how can we encourage this kind of mentality? Because this isn't just, we think the right thing to do. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. There are problems that gene drive could solve such as malaria <clears throat> that are immediately urgent. In the time I've been talking about 10 kids have died of malaria. That's a lot. Should we be sitting here twiddling our thumbs when we could plausibly be doing something about it? That's a hard moral question that we'll come back to. But if we think about using gene drive for something else and we screw it up and there's an accident, well, a single tragic death in a clinical trial set the field of gene therapy back by over a decade. If we accidentally turn the bulk of a wild species into GMOs, because we have a laboratory accident involving a CRISPR-based gene drive, I'd be willing to bet that it would set back efforts to use gene drive against malaria by at least a decade. The expected number of people who will die, if there is a 1% chance of a decade-long delay in using gene drive against malaria, is 25,000 children. Think about that. A 1% chance of a decade-long delay 
in using the technology for good is 25,000 dead children, 1% chance. That could come from saying the wrong thing to a flippant journalist could derail the negotiations. We don't normally think about the numbers like that. And I guess I'm urging all of you to try to think that way. What could the consequences be on the large scale? And that's why I'm another reason to be so careful when it comes to thinking about how you're going to use these new capabilities. Because if you're the first ones or even you're early and you screw it up, you screw it up for everyone. You lose all of the benefits that might have arisen for some period of time until we decide we know more and can try again. So we really don't want to screw up. And that means that screw up doesn't have to be practical. It doesn't have to be a lab leak. It doesn't have to be anything like that. It could be you, oh, I don't know, introduce genetic engineering to the general public in the form of big ag engineering tomatoes and things. And oh, wait, no, even better. Let's, do, let's not just do tomatoes shelf life. Let's engineer things so that they are pesticide tolerant and we can spray way more pest herbicides on, on all of our crops and thereby increase yields a little bit and decrease prices by a few cents. And that's how we're gonna introduce the technology to the general public. That did not go well, let's not do that. So we need to address problems that are obvious to everyone. It was not obvious to everyone that what we needed was more glyphosate on our crops. So don't do that. Openly share your proposals before experiments begin, actively invite concerns and community guidance and arrange for independent assessment. Because if you're developing the technology, you are biased. You cannot make a wise decision on whether or not it should be used. This is why we have independent review. Turns out that although we have clinical trials, we don't really have a good regulatory system for this kind of stuff. So you need to set it up and ensure that it's going to happen right. And don't just assume that the federal and state regulators are gonna know what to do or do the right thing. You need to ensure that the right thing will happen independent of what anybody else is, is going to do. Particularly because if you're pushing technology ahead, regulatory system is behind. They don't know what's possible. They've never dealt with it before. So how can we test these principles? Because again, we're being humble. I think this is probably all mostly correct, but maybe I'm wrong. How do we find out? You have to test it on a small scale because trying to muck with the incentives of the scientific ecosystem is also something that we should be cautious about. So this was in fact the reason for Mice Against Ticks. It is not in fact that it sucks to go outside and go hiking and not notice you get bitten by a tick because it crawled up in your hair or something and then get Lyme disease and have a chronic illness for the rest of your life. It destroys people's lives. It's not nearly as bad as malaria, but it's really awful. But the project doesn't exist because we want to solve Lyme disease. The project exists because we wanted to test the principles of community-guided eco-technology development somewhere where we could figure out, does it work and how likely is it to succeed? And it's frankly way easier to work with a community if it's near to you. And the local ecological problem that is obvious to just about everyone who lives in this area that could plausibly be addressed by engineering a wild species is Lyme disease. It is the most common vector-borne disease here in the United States, in fact, and it's mostly concentrated around here. So how does Lyme disease happen? Well, as I mentioned previously, you have these mice, which are the main reservoir of the disease in, in the environment. There are others, but they're the bulk of it. Exactly how much varies by the environment. And then you have the ticks, which are the actual vector. And then you have the actual pathogen, which is Borrelia burgdorferi, what a name. And it gets passed from an infected mouse to an infected tick. And ticks bite three times. So if an infected tick bites an uninfected mouse, it infects that mouse. That mouse gets bitten by an uninfected tick, it infects that tick. That's why it's cyclical. Mice are not born infected, the ticks are not born infected. They infect each other. And the Lyme bacterium doesn't care about us. We're just the side effect. We're a dead end host, too bad, but when an infected tick bites us, we get often Lyme disease. And if we don't get it treated, then we have a chronic illness for the rest of our lives. That's unfortunate. What if we engineered the mice to be immune so that they couldn't be infected? Then you would have infected ticks biting mice, but the mice would be immune so they wouldn't get infected. And then the next generation of ticks would not get infected when they bite those mice. And you would short circuit the cycle and the number of infected ticks would go down and down and down. The mice aren't the only reservoir, so it's not gonna go down to zero. 
but they're the main ones, so it would go down a lot. This is the idea. How could you do that? Why, why could I be confident that this is something we can do? Well, we have a vaccine against Lyme disease. Your dogs can get it, but you can't due to anti-vax backlash, earliest manifestations. It's the same vaccine though. There's another one that might come on the market in 2026, 2027, depending on how things go. But point is, if you have a vaccine, you know you can generate an immune response that can immunize someone against disease. It's not perfect, but most individuals, it can prevent infection. And we know that if we can vaccinate a mouse, it becomes disease resistant. And in fact, there's a study where some heroic souls over several acres trapped every mouse they could find and manually injected them the vaccine and let them go and then looked at what happened to infection rates in the local environment. I can't even imagine doing this for two years, but that's what they did. And sure enough, infection rates in the local tip population plummeted. So we figure if in fact we could immunize all of the mice, and obviously this is not a sustainable thing, even if you do bait-based vaccines, you just can't keep spreading it everywhere. But if we engineered the mice such that they and their descendants were immune, then we can be pretty confident that this would work. How do you do that? Well, again, we know that we can immunize them. What does that produce? Leads to antibody production, antibodies that can bind to and kill the pathogen. Part of the immunology black magic that we don't understand is how in heck an antibody alone without the rest of the immune system, without complement, without any of the other things we think are, are important, can just kill the pathogen in a test tube. Because it does. We have no idea why this works, but it works. Why argue with it? So. If we take vaccinated mice, we pull out their antibodies, or more specifically, the cells that produce antibodies, and then we take the gene encoding that antibody, we can encode it in the germline, the inherited DNA of the mouse and the reproductive cells, and then any mouse that inherits the gene encoding that antibody is going to be immune. So we know all of the pieces were in place. We just needed to learn to engineer the mice and pick an antibody and encode it. I figured this was enough to go to communities and say, we think we can do this. There's a bunch of ways we could introduce these genes to the mouse population. Do you want us to do it? Who, what communities are relevant? Well, ideally you want an island, right? Because there you only need to reduce, introduce so many mice. And as it turns out, Lyme disease rates on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard are higher than just about anywhere else in the world. People hate it there. And there's another advantage to working with those communities. They are extremely well-educated. Just about everyone there, knows someone who can understand the technical details behind this proposal and the ongoing project. That's very rare in the world. They also speak English and they have a culture of New England town hall democracy. That is people are used to, oh, there's an issue of interest to the community. Let's all get together in a room and talk about it and decide what to do. That also doesn't exist everywhere. So you put all these factors together and Oh, I guess there's one more that's important. Anyone see any ethical problems with going ahead with using gene drive against malaria? I mean, obviously on the saving lives grounds, it's important that we do it as soon as possible, but what are some of the issues there? Anyone? There's something else, another disease that people get that is by uh, some of the Could be, looks like not, but could be. Yeah, so there's, there's things that could go wrong, absolutely. So you gotta study the things that go wrong. What eats the mosquitoes? Would that be affected? and so forth, but just in terms of perceptions and the like. Anyone? Exactly, a lot of people there who don't speak English, don't have any kind of scientific training at all or higher, higher education or some of them really any education, and have, speak only languages that don't even have words for genes or DNA. And what's more, whose healthcare systems rely primarily on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is the primary funder supporting gene drive work against malaria. There's huge power dynamics issues where you can say, is this neocolonialism? We're testing our radical new technology on these people and their environment, and we haven't used it on our own first. But if we propose using it on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> That is the complete opposite. No one can tell a story about scientists using the residents of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard as guinea pigs to test their radical new technology. The very notion is ludicrous. There's no way you can force those people to do whatever, anything that they don't want to do. 
And this is obvious. So we avoid a lot of social complications there as well. So what we did is we just said, look, we're here not actually primarily to solve Lyme disease. We're here because we want to test a new way of doing science, or at least thought people had talked about it, but no one had really done it. We haven't raised any money. We haven't run any experiments, but we're pretty sure that we can use one of several different ways to heritably immunize the mice on your island in order to break the cycle of Lyme disease transmission. Is this something that you want? You know, here's what we think we would need. This is only a concept. It only moves forward if you say you want it. And it's not, you know, a substitute for anything now. It's, it would be a far future kind of thing. And relevant things. Do you want this at all? Or should we walk away? Because if you don't want it, we're not going to develop it. We have other things we can be working on. What are the things that you would want to evaluate to be confident are true before you release, ecologically, socially, whatever? On a technical level, there's several different ways we could do this, immunizing against Lyme disease, immunizing against ticks, immunizing against both, using genes from the mice themselves, using genes from other species. These are the options. Which one do you want? And we will pursue that one. Where would you want to test it? Presumably not on an inhabited island, on a smaller island, ideally uninhabited. And who should be doing the monitoring and assessment that is not us? But I made it very clear that the point was to do this to serve as an example to other communities of how ideally this kind of stuff should be done, to try to nudge the incentives of science to favor earlier evaluation and, and guidance of technology development from the very beginning on the grounds that, frankly, with sufficiently powerful technology, scientists are not wise enough on our own to make good decisions on this. So we, they were interested, and so we went back many, many, many times. I've only went up through 2018, early 2019 here, and we got, and fortunately it worked. Turns out the easiest way to get New York Times coverage is not to actually do anything in the lab, it's to actually think, hey, maybe we should go talk to a relevant community who would be impacted before we do something in the lab. And then you can get written up in the New York Times, which is great. So we got a lot of press about how you should do this. And now that has actually changed incentives for other folk in the field working on eco-technologies. There's now much more pressure to actually talk to communities in advance. Now, we could do this because we have more discretionary funding, because I'm at the MIT Media Lab. We do a bunch of other things. Most scientists don't have the funding flexibility to do this, so it's kind of unfair to ask them, ask it of them. I want to be very, very clear of that. But I still think it's the right thing to do, and we need to change the incentives so the funders will give them money to do this kind of thing. That is a large, that is a large fraction of the goal here. And what was the result? Well, so they set up steering committees to guide the research and development, basically sample the population, talk to people, figure out what they think, and then convey that to us. And we, would gave, we give the steering committees regular updates on which path we're going and any roadblocks that might need us to change. They definitely preferred using, well, they preferred killing all the ticks, which is not something that we think we can actually do yet. Maybe we're still working on that. But they wanted us to stick with genes from the white-footed mice themselves. They didn't want us pulling genes from lab mice or any other species. This was a divide in the community. It was about one third, two thirds. And the one third, the ones that didn't care where the genes came from, pretty much universally had some kind of higher education training in STEM. And the ones who opposed it almost universally did not. This is just a very strange educational divide that we observed. But regardless, the majority of the population clearly doesn't want us to use genes from other species. So they want us to use something cisgenic. So that's what we're doing. Importantly, some community members raised concerns about things that might go wrong with during the introduction phase, might there be a slightly increased immediate Lyme disease risk that would depend on how fast you introduce them that we actually hadn't initially considered. So someone without a PhD, just raising in a town hall meeting, something relevant that we hadn't thought of. So this is why you go to communities and ask other people, because even folks who don't have a technical background can bring up relevant technical concerns that you haven't thought of because you can't think of everything. And above all, there are a lot of people who support this project, not because they really want the idea of, like the idea of engineering the mice. They might really dislike some of them, the idea of engineering the mice. They don't think we should be engineering wild animals for any reason. 
but they strongly support the project. And the reason is they think that this is how science should be done. And if they don't support this kind of thing, when scientists come to them and say, we should do this now, then how can they really say that they want science to be done that way? You gotta meet someone part way. So they support the process, even though they're going to vote against releasing the mice. But this is a really strong effect. So on Chappie, Chappaquiddick, it's a sub island of Martha's Vineyard. The Homeowners Association met without our knowledge. There was an MIT alum who owns a house there. And he knew about our project, had come to some of our meetings, independently proposed that the Chappie Homeowners Association support the project and volunteer Chappie for, to be an early field trial site, which the federal regulators would never in a million years allow, but nevertheless. And it passed by over a hundred to zero. Zero, zero for genetically engineering the wild mice on Chappie. Now this might've been due to the fact that the charismatic president of the association had just recovered from Lyme disease. But even so, that's, that's quite a divide from how these things have historically gone. So I just wanted to note that I'm not telling you pretty much anything more about the technical side of this. And just highlighting that we have an amazing technical team led by Joanna Buckthall, who's our project manager and a PhD student, and many other folks in my lab. And then we have amazing collaborators, and I particularly want to highlight Sam Telford, who's here at Tufts, or particularly at the vet school. Sam is amazing. He knows more about tick-borne disease than anyone alive, and he's just an awesome collaborator to work with. So that's Mice Against Ticks. And I just want to highlight another story briefly, because I know we don't have much time. What do you do when a government wants to use your technology and you're not sure that they're going to do it the right way? This came up very early because New Zealand, or Aotearoa, to use the, the native Maori term, really wants to get rid of some of their invasive species. And they committed to get rid of their top three mammalian invasives by 2050. There is basically no way they are going to do that without some kind of incredibly advanced technology, such as perhaps gene drive. And note, furthermore, I'm just going to go, going back to this. We are not using gene drive for mice against ticks. We don't need to. They're islands. Introduce enough mice, and resistance will get up to a high enough level that you don't need to. And that's an example of starting small, altering the population without the gene drive. Although there are ways of making the gene drive not spread indefinitely that we could use. They don't want us to use CRISPR because CRISPR is not from the mice. So in Aotearoa, they wanted to use gene drive to suppress populations, which is something you can do. We can turn them all into males, for example. All the ones that inherit will be males. Obviously, the population is going to crash. We can also spread loss of fertility genes um, through females. And But we were somewhat uneasy at this idea of the New Zealand government just moving forward with this technology, particularly because they weren't being really clear on how they were going to go about it. That is, were they going to use the full power version that spreads indefinitely? Because if you use that on rats, how did rats get to Aotearoa in the first place? Anyone? They're invasive species. How did they get there? Boats. On boats. Did we invite them? Not Rattus rattus and Rattus norvegicus, the big ones that were a problem. And if they got there on boats on their own, they can get off there on boats as well, presumably. So if you build a self-propagating gene drive and you want to use it in your pristine ecological paradise to get rid of the nasty mammalian invasives, those nasty mammalian invasives are going to take ship for the rest of the world. And then you are going to suppress populations of rats everywhere else. So we wanted to make sure that they were you know, very aware of this, but it was also my fault for reasons I'll get to. So what we presented to the Maori is we basically said, we want to ensure that there is local guidance of technologies considered for invasive control, emphasize that they don't exist, that we don't want to test them in Aotearoa. We want to test them here because the reason we're developing this is for urban rodent control. A glue trap is one of the most heinous things humanity has ever invented. We kill a, over a billion rodents with rodenticides every year. The super warfarin class typically take up to 72 hours to die. It's like a cluster headache, which is worse than a migraine for that whole time. We do that to about a billion rodents a year. We need better, more humane methods of rodent control because that's not as bad as factory farming, but it's really up there. And I haven't even gotten into the feeder mouse industry. So we want to do this for local reasons, but if the New Zealand government really wants to use it for conservation, then we need to address that. And we wanted to figure out whether the Mothranga Maori, their local 
cultural knowledge of ecosystem could tell whether or not it was a good idea. And our main point was, look, if the Maori broadly are not supportive of this, then we're happy to publicly oppose it. As the inventor, that can make a difference in terms of public opinion. And essentially, this is really the key bit. Those who don't share Maori values should still take their concerns seriously, even if those concerns can't be translated into our language. And our Maori partners say it and say that there's the physical world, there's the mental world, and there's a spiritual world. And Bryce says, it's not your fault. You were raised in the wrong culture, but you're blind to two out of three. And I was like, really? I'm blind to the mental? That's not fair, but different conception of mental. Point being, we know that indigenous cultural knowledge has borne out in many ways time and time again. We also know that it typically takes the scientific literature a good two decades or so to figure out why in heck it happened that way. So unless you're willing to wait a couple of decades, really you should just need to take them at their word that this is a bad idea and not ask them to explain it in terms that we can understand. You just trust them. It's their environment. It's their call. But I failed them very early on in trying to fix my original screw up. So when I originally published on CRISPR-based gene drive, I said, these are the things that it could be used for. And one of them was sustainable pest management in, and controlling invasive species. This was the figure. You might assume from reading the figure that it's, this technology can just do this. In the main text, of course, I noted that if, unless you come up, came up with a localizable way to keep it from spreading indefinitely, then you would end up suppressing all the rat populations in the world. That was in the main text. How many people read the main text of the paper as opposed to looking at the pretty figures? Yeah, so this was my fault. And our later work showed that this is in fact super invasive itself. Even a really terrible gene drive that only copies itself half the time and is costly otherwise, never gets above 42% of the population typically, still, it requires very, very few organisms to be released to take off. And what's more, people will deliberately move things if they think it's economically advantageous to them. New Zealand has the tightest biocontrol in the world at its borders, and New Zealand farmers still smuggled in rabbit Khaleesi virus from Australia illegally because they wanted to control the rabbits. You should assume the same thing will happen here. So I wrote a paper seeking to remedy my error with a New Zealand co-author, and this was before I first met our Maori partners. And at the revision stage, after I had met them, I just didn't think to ask them what they thought about the language. <sighs> Turns out that paper resulted in a bit of a firestorm in New Zealand because it effectively said, hey, you can't use the full power gene drive. Here's what would happen if Aotearoa tried to do this. And it would jeopardize efforts against malaria and so forth. So we need to ensure that we have these localized forms and that we're confident in that you only use those for field trials and don't develop the full power stuff, which many people took umbrage at as suggesting that they were planning to use the full power stuff. And I'm not going to say yes or no, but there were certainly rumors that that was in fact what they were doing. And there was certainly a lot of evidence people didn't really understand the distinction. But regardless, it reunited a local firestorm politically and as Mel pointed out my naivete of the political situation that Maori are in will likely lead to consequences for the Maori that I didn't consider. That is, I kicked the hornet's nest of local politics. And if you often get the short end of the stick in local politics, then when the hornets fly, you're most likely to get stung. So, we went to the Maori in part because it's their environment, it's their call, moral, spiritual reasons, treaty reasons, et cetera. And because we thought they had useful ecological knowledge that they could tell us, is this a good idea ecologically? But what, if, what I forgot is that there's also a local political ecosystem that as an outsider, you also don't understand. And that's why it's even more important to reach out to communities and say, how are you thinking about this? And have very clear communication channels. And again, from the beginning. So I wrote a formal apology for my thoughtless action and they were generous enough to forgive me. And so we've, at least pre-pandemic, we went back many times um, to various hui's with <clears throat> many local iwi's and leaders to discuss this. And they taught us a number of useful things which are relevant here. 
but we're running out of time. So I just wanted to end by noting that technology is power. And when you gain the power to act, then of course, if you do act, if you use that power, you are responsible morally for all of the consequences, intended and unintended. But the thing that we often miss is that if you have the power to intervene and you choose not to use it, you let the status quo continue, whatever problem you might have solved, the ongoing cost of that problem continuing that you could have addressed and didn't, that's also on you. It's your moral responsibility no matter what. As soon as you gain the power to intervene, you will use it or you will not use it, and you are responsible for that choice. It is a choice. Sitting on it is a choice. And our minds don't work that way. We don't tend to judge other people for not acting. And that's a cognitive error. We are responsible either way. So as we gain increasing power over the natural world, to the extent that we could intervene and we choose not to for whatever reason, maybe it's local politics would be a problem for local people. What if it's a virtue thing where you made a promise and then you're bound by it and then you can't do it? Then how do you weigh off these different ethical frameworks? Because they tell us different things. All of our ethical frameworks evolved over time and in cultures with lower levels of technology than we have. And what's more, a lot of people think, oh, well, there's must be a certain perfect answer to ethics, right? There must be some real right thing to do out there. And maybe there is, but that doesn't mean that we get to know about it because take mathematics. Turns out in mathematics, you cannot have a formal system that is both consistent and complete. That is, you can't have something that is consistent within itself, follows all the logical rules and covers all possible truths. It's been proven that this is impossible. And if you can't have that in math, what makes you think you can have it in morality? We are always going to be uncertain. There are always going to be competing ethical demands. But the bottom line is this. It's on us. And technology is getting more and more powerful. So I like going back to XKCD because this really emphasizes how accidentally I really stepped in it. The circled areas are those that my laboratory actively works on. <laughs> but my message to all of you is, look, AI is getting better. Biotech's getting a lot more powerful. And let's just say that one of my graduate students needed to be able to get a sample of influenza virus of an arbitrary strain. She had never worked with virology before, had only a year and a half of a mammalian tissue culture experience. And she was able to use a reverse genetics protocol to successfully build an influenza replicon with no outside assistance whatsoever. Second year graduate student. All the genomes of pathogens are online, including ones for things like 1918 influenza. That means that she could order synthetic DNA from a company that doesn't screen and obtain infectious samples of 1918 influenza virus. So it could probably 30,000 other people in the world. That's the dark side of these technologies that we're developing. Democratization is great when the technology is safe, but we do not want to democratize the ability to cause pandemics because COVID was mild. So that's where we're getting at. In the long run, we have increasing power and we have to figure out how to use it wisely. And I don't know the answer to how best to do that, but we had best find out and we had best find out soon. And all of you are in an excellent position to begin doing that. I look forward to seeing what happens. Thanks. Thank you so much for that thought-provoking presentation. I know I'm going to be thinking about this for weeks to come. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes because- I'll stay a little bit later. It's my fault for going over. Because yeah. he has to teach. Um, so I will invite anybody in the audience online and also in the room to ask. First off, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, I'm just wondering, um, were there any other, or are there any other species or diseases or maybe ecological issues in general um, that your team has considered, either maybe for future projects or something that you almost took up instead of this? Um, I'm just wondering, like, where you, what you think the next step might be if this proves to be really the big deal. So we haven't touched the malaria. We've just let the target malaria team handle that. That's obviously the big one. Um, I've tried to encourage folks to begin developing it for 
uh, schistosomiasis, which is another really, really nasty parasitic disease in low-income countries that causes cognitive growth stunting to, for tens of millions of children. Probably the worst after malaria. Um, I've tried to encourage folk to potentially look at desert locusts. So desert locusts are the eighth biblical plague, right? They're desert grasshoppers. And when it rains, then the population explodes. There's a lot to eat. They, they eat everything. And then they fly out of the desert in swarms and cause famines when they eat up people's crops. Turns out we know the genetics of the switch that causes them to switch from being solitary to being gregarious. So we could build a gene drive to switch it off permanently. So they just would not form swarms anymore. They would stay desert grasshoppers. And we know from genetics that there are stable populations in the desert that have never swarmed, or at least not for the last thousand years. So it wouldn't be dooming them to extinction or anything. We would just be saying, nope, God's eighth biblical plague, you don't get to do that anymore. We are taming you. And once we no longer can be affected and people will no longer starve from your depredations, then we'll switch you back on again. And But the big one that this crowd might be most interested in is animal well-being. So there is a species in South America, used to be in North America, but we got rid of it, called Cochleomaya hominivorax, the New World Screwer. And this is a bot fly that lays its eggs in open wounds, small as a tick bite, and the maggots drill their way through the living flesh, consuming the animal, and emit, they emit, they cultivate bacteria that emit signals that summon new gravid females to lay more eggs. So very often the animal is literally devoured alive by flesh-eating maggots. The treatment in people is you give the person morphine immediately while the surgeon extracts all the maggots. It's that painful. And by my calculations, there's about a billion host animals parasitized in this way every year. They're all warm-blooded mammals and birds. So if you do the math, the typical lifetime of an insect species is over a million years. So if we leave this thing out there, then we are, and we don't like turn the world into computronium or whatever, who knows. But if, if the world goes on as it has, then we will be responsible for on the order of 10 to the 15th mammals and birds being devoured alive by flesh-eating maggots. Note that even if we continue factory farming for another 100 years, then that will only be 10 to the 13th animals. So unless it's worse to be a factory farmed broiler hen than it is to be devoured alive by flesh-eating maggots, getting rid of that species, removing it from the wild, is perhaps, morally speaking, a hundred times as important as ending factory farming tomorrow. That's just a, a teaser of how many living things are out there in the environment. But are we really willing to say, this is not okay? This is not moral. We disapprove of nature causing this much horrendous suffering to wild creatures, and we are going to do something about it. I don't know, but we, have the, but we are gaining the power to do something about it. And that's probably the most blatant example. So I, I went to Uruguay and Argentina, but mainly Uruguay, and talked about it with them. And the local scientists there have decided that they do want to do something about it and are working to develop gene drive in that species. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, I had a question about like the interviewing process with the community to like tap on the need for them. So I am working on engineering like probiotic for therapeutic de delivery. And I'm also taking like customer discovery design thinking. And the question that I wanna like, or something that I wanna get out is like, since you have the experience and you already did it, how did you get out this, like from them, like the technical kind of like asking technical question without being too problematic for them to understand? And also what are the clusters of interview questions that you wanna like span or to get out the most uh, detailed feedback from them? Like some non-technical, some technical and some, yeah. Thanks. That's a good and really hard question. <laughs> so I don't think there is any easy answer. And I think, unfortunately, it's discipline specific. But it, a lot of it comes down to practice. That is, try it on a bunch of people you know with varying technical backgrounds and see what comes across and what doesn't, and then try to refine it into the major concepts. So for your particular, so for your particular innovation, it depend, you know, think about what the different ways that you could go about it. 
that they might care about for one reason or another, the different paths that you could go down and attempts to explain the differences that might matter to them. So in our case, it was genes from same species, genes from other species, target the, target the Lyme pathogen or target the ticks or both. Those were sort of the main questions. So in, in your case, it's going to be something else. I don't know what the different possible technical approaches are, but similarly, you need to figure out what, what are those things. So we had some pre-meetings with local folks before the big first Nantucket meeting, including with the, um, with the health director on Nantucket and a few other local community leaders, just to get an idea of what they thought people would most want to hear. And so that's how we came up with our list. And then essentially just arranged a meeting with the Board of Health, which are always public because of the Massachusetts's open meetings law. And then they actually did the advertising to get a bunch of community members to come. Actually, I would like to follow up on that question. And my question is about the power of communities uh, because not all communities are the same, yeah. but also within a community, not everybody has the same power. So how do you navigate this question? Who is the community who is gonna make a decision for all of us, given that it's almost impossible to contain this technology to even an island, even in this very interesting case study, mice can also jump on a boat, right? So how do you navigate who makes those decisions, which communities and who in the community makes those decisions? And also I would like to add, in, since once the cat is out of the bag, uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, regulations? Uh, I know this is a very uh, fast moving field. Is Are the regulations keeping up with that? And uh, of course, this is not only at the regional level, we're talking about the national level, but also the international level. So if you can comment on that, that would be. So there. your first question is again, very challenging because addressing overall power dynamics within communities is just probably not something that we can really do. What that is, communities have a given governance structure. It's not really our place to come in and say you should govern yourselves differently. That's not my area of expertise and I don't live there. It's not really my business or problem. Although if you view something as you know, a, a tyrannical arrangement as unethical, you can choose not to engage. But relative, we just have not dealt with that for the most part. But the exception arguably is with the Maori iwis, some of whom are in very different circumstances based on when they settled with the government for treaty violations. And our position was essentially to engage with sort of the, those insofar as you could spread all, all the iwis on one principal axis. We wanted to engage with some on each end. So that's what we did. Also one in the South, one in the North, and they had very different preferences as to what they would want in terms of technologies. The South is more okay with more powerful technology because there's fewer of them and they have much larger territory to manage. And so they want more gene drive-like interventions. They, whereas the North has more people who, and they would prefer to keep a more active hand, especially if there are reasons for their people to essentially be wilderness managers, to oversee the, the fukupopo, the web of relationships and ensure that the intervention is going well. They want more essentially wilderness manager positions and reasons for them to go out there and, and shepherd the environment. And so they don't want as powerful of a technology. On the regulatory front, I have been uh, recommending that countries update their regulations to account for the fact that now organisms engineered heritably in the laboratory can in fact spread those alterations through a wild population and that a single laboratory escape of an organism could in fact end up editing the bulk of a species. And by my last count, precisely four countries have updated their regulations at all to account for this. Although to be fair, the EU says, oh, well, we just assume that all GMOs will do that. Which when you think about it is a absurdity on a whole different level. So no, regulations are always going to be very, very far behind. But if you are developing any kind of novel product that is going to require regulation, try to figure out which agent, which local agency is going to have it and reach out to them. So we reached out to uh, FDA, Center for Veterinary Medicine, who's almost certainly going to have this. 
and I just gave a seminar there and they asked a bunch of questions and we did our best to answer them and so it sort of got on the same page early. So I very strongly recommend doing that. That was a great talk, it, I, Kevin. I, it provides me some reassurance that there are actually people thinking about this seriously. So that's great. Um, my question to you is we've done a bunch of like community-based field studies with our fertility control, our deer contraception work. And the biggest challenge we always have is to convince people we're doing research, but all they want to know about is the result. Are we going to be able to reduce their deer yes. population? Do you have any tricks for keeping the science piece of it in the forefront? Uh, so this is the hardest. This is this one is hard because how do you know how well it's going to work until you've you done it? Exactly. You don't. And so this is why I emphasize with the antibodies, we had all of these pieces of information that we could be pretty confident that if you encode that bloody antibody in the mouse, it's gonna flip and work because we know exactly what level of antibody will do it. We've actually infused naive mice with a given concentration of antibodies and figured out what level works. And we know that we can express proteins at that level in a mouse. Like we had all of the pieces and I couldn't promise that the gene drive would work, but I never did promise that the gene drive would work. It turns out gene drive doesn't work super well in mammals. Like, it, oh, like the copying works pretty well in females, but not nearly as well as in mosquitoes and hardly at all in males. So yeah, that's... Um, So when you're less certain, you, you have to be honest about it. I mean, I made it clear. I was like, I, I will not give you a timeline on this project. Engineering biology takes a long time and I can give you the best case scenario, but it might not even ultimately, like I, it might take 20 years. And from when we started, it has been six years, seven years. And we now have a number of great technical advances that we've had to, but we had to do a lot of science that wasn't anticipated because the white-footed mice are very different and people hadn't worked out their reproductive biology. Turns out you can't actually engineer them until you've worked out their reproductive biology. So that added a very long time and we pretty much just worked that out. So, The focus on science, I think, is partly about choosing your audience and being sure to invite a very science literate crowd. Yeah. So I've always had good luck working with the Museum of Science or the MIT Museum to get a crowd of very science literate folks because the the project rarity for rodent suppression, um, Cambridge Biosafety Committee, I guess we're technically not in Cambridge, but Cambridge, like the city has its own biosafety committee run by Sam Litson of the Cambridge Department of Health. And so their job is to oversee novel biotechnologies in Cambridge. Like, okay, the Cambridge government has come up with a body that whose job it is to deal with weird crap like, like we deal with. So we just went to them and said, what do you think of this? What do you think of the idea of our testing these, what we call them daughterless mice at MIT, if we can make them efficiently enough and they're, you know, it works well in the laboratory, we'd love to test them at on the MIT campus because why not? And we can engage with our local community, test them on ourselves. Ultimately, they're intended for urban rodent control. Again, no initial gene drive, just males that only have sons and their sons only have sons and their sons only have sons. And you introduce enough of these males in the population, there's gonna be a lot fewer females. Population's gonna shrink down to a low level and that's actually more resilient than if you get rid of all of them then they'll just reinvade. So, There's yeah. no good answer. There. There's no good answer. There's no good answer to many, many of these questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And I know you have to run, but just a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I missed it, but is there a timeline for this project? Do you think it will ever uh, see the light of day? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I, the question is, will we get to field trials before there's a new vaccine on the market? which isn't necessarily going to, which I don't think would, I mean, new vaccine is not gonna solve the problem because it's only 75% protective. So as soon as it's on the market, I will get it. I suspect many of my collaborators have gotten the veterinary version. Um, <clears throat> just a suspicion. Uh, certainly not recommending that you do that, although it is identical in formulation to the human version that was withdrawn over anti-vax concerns. Anyway, but only 75% protective probably isn't really enough. And if young children can't get it, Young kids get Lyme disease at a really high rate. That's what a lot of people are most concerned about. I think there's still going to be a lot of interest in mice against ticks. And what I and to that point about mice can take the ferry too. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is that we're using a special form of gene drive called underdominance, 
I call it the majority wins version, let the genes vote. So it's a way of ensuring that whichever version of a gene is in the local majority, natural selection will favor that version. And you basically do this by arranging such that half of the offspring of animals that have one copy of each don't survive. So this has the effect of favoring one pure one version or pure the other version as a function of whichever one is more common. So if you let the genes vote, that means that one neighborhood can introduce a ton of mice, drive it above 50% in that neighborhood, and it will stick around reasonably long in that neighborhood. You'll have to boost it periodically. But natural selection itself will function to keep the engineered alleles in that neighborhood. So if Cambridge wanted it and Somerville didn't, it wouldn't be a perfect dividing line, but it would largely keep the populations where you intended them to be. So that's what we hope to develop and actually use on the islands. And then that could also be used town by town on the mainland. And then if it worked well enough and there were no ecological effects 10, 20 years down the line, then you could use a full power CRISPR-based gene drive. Because one of the things that Maori taught us is that our conception of species is really unusual. It's weird in the Western educated, industrialized, rich democracy sense. We think of species as being defined by their DNA content or most recent common ancestor. Maori say, stupid Pakeha, you only care about this because you're using it as a proxy for whether there's gonna be ecological effects. A species is defined by its ecological niche. If you care about engineering the rodents, what matters is not what's in the mammalian DNA of the rodent, what matters is what DNA you find within the rodent. That is to say the microbiome within that rodent, that assembly of microbes, you will never find a, a rat without those microbes in it. You will never find that exact assembly of microbes without a rat. So why are you saying these things are different? So we call this the ecosystemic concept. You are allowed to use CRISPR in an organism if you pull that CRISPR system from a microbe that is always present within that organism anyway. And they view that as being acceptable. That, that to them is cisgenic. And what's interesting is when we went to folks on Nantucket in the vineyard and raised this, everyone we've spoken with so far has kind of been like, oh, well, if that's how indigenous communities view it, and it's an ecological thing, we'll just defer to them on that. It's like, wow, okay, that's powerful. But yeah, perception is very important in terms of how, how you weigh and view these things. So maybe 20 years down the line, assuming other things don't go crazy, we will perhaps be able to use a CRISPR-based gene drive using a microbial CRISPR that's already found in the white-footed mice to spread this to the all of Eastern North America. Maybe, maybe. Thank you very much. All right.